Uh, my name is Greg Buckenap. I'm a professor in the School of Public Administration. I've been working with issues of migration policy uh, for almost 20 years now, but it's really only in the past five years that I've taken the leap into integration. And that's what I want to talk with you about today, is the way in which studying integration, some projects that we've recently completed, a project that's ongoing, a project that we're going to be starting soon, how these have not only had sort of spin-off effects for our scholarly activity, but how they've also had important effects as well for the way in which we as researchers engage with practitioners such as yourselves, and also uh, for the way in which we get the opportunity to go out and train street-level bureaucrats to think about these issues so that we can increase their capacity and increase their toolkits. So I'm going to be speaking about three things, research, collaboration with practitioners, and commissioned education. I'll try to keep my remarks to around 30, 35 minutes, and I'm going to start by speaking about research and really take you on this journey, how one project fed into another and then fed ultimately into collaboration and education. What we can begin with is a, is a project, if we think back to 2013. Uh, 2013, prior to the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, many of us, both academics and those of you out in the public sector, who were thinking about integration issues, were thinking about a very different integration challenge than the one we face today. The integration challenge that you were thinking about had to do largely with what were either called Central and Eastern European migrants or mobile EU citizens, uh, largely from the new uh, EU states post-2000 and post-2007. And this was something that was, uh, that was certainly occupying practitioners and researchers trying to understand what the implications of the presence of these individuals uh, in many of our municipalities were, and it also uh, questions of how we could best develop measures uh, to integrate them, those that were here long-term or those that were here in a circular sense. Uh, so this, this was a project called Imagination that was uh, funded by Vinova, the Swedish Innovation Agency. And what we did was we brought together uh, scholars uh, from uh, a number of countries, Sweden, the Netherlands, Austria, and also as, an, as an, interesting, an interesting comparison, Turkey. And I'll come back to Turkey rather briefly in a second because it actually makes sense in this context, where we took two cities in each of these countries and we worked through a set of tasks trying to understand understand who the migrants were that were present, what the social implications of their presence were, and then what sorts of responses we were seeing. Now, I understand, of course, you look at Turkey and you say, why is Turkey involved in a project like this? Because what we actually see is that uh, Turkey was the recipient of a large number of Central and Eastern European migrants, primarily from places like Bulgaria, that were crossing the border, that were engaging in informal labor. And so Turkey, with a very different type of institutional infrastructure and political system than what we had in our other three country cases, uh, was also facing similar challenges. So over the three-year process, what we did was uh, we spent about a, a year working on each one of these, uh, mapping and analyzing the types of Central and Eastern European migrants, which led to a typology called types of migrants. Uh, and I know that academics, uh, if, you're, if you're going to sort of raise an eyebrow at us, you, you all know that what we love to do is come up with typologies, and then you can ask the question, are they at all meaningful? Uh, well, we'll actually come to a, a, one of the other projects in a bit where you'll see it actually had a payoff uh, for practitioners in Western Europe in large cities. We also considered the implications for urban regions uh, in a number of areas. And what we saw uh, in each of our cases uh, in different ways was that there were concerns uh, among the public sector with, with really three key issues. Uh, number one was educational dequalification, that we had significant number of mobile EU citizens arriving who were forced to take, uh, forced to take work at lower uh, 
uh, at lower occupational skill levels than they already uh, would qualify normally and how they could go about uh, moving back into a sector that was appropriate with their education. Uh, negative effects of non-registration for those that weren't high skilled. Uh, as you all know, and per certainly the Swedish case stands out this way compared to uh, the Dutch case and the Austrian case, is that you have a large number of non-registered mobile EU citizens uh, and that lack of registration and that lack of opportunity to register uh, because of concerns that these individuals might not qualify to actually get a job uh, leads to very, very uh, precarious situation for them when it comes to both employment and housing. And then finally, overall, uh, a limited chance on the housing market, that the more tightly regulated the housing market, we saw the more difficult it was for these individuals uh, to, get, to get adequate housing. You know the Swedish experience. Uh, by contrast, I can tell you a little bit about the Dutch experience. They're your largest uh, group that shows up are largely uh, seasonal agricultural workers from Eastern Europe and uh, largely what they were finding in housing when they were outside of the cities, uh, they were, they were uh, put in barracks, uh, in essence these temporary barracks for migrant farm workers right by these large industrial agricultural centers. Uh, but anything that had this sense of uh, of if not permanency, at least uh, more sustainability in their lives was, was absolutely lacking. And then we finished up with a year, and this is what Gothenburg was responsible for, this urban governance of CEE migrants, mobile EU citizens. And what we have here, we saw, is that we have ultimately an issue, this, this, this right for a European citizen to move anywhere within the European Union. Uh, this is obviously a multi-level issue. Uh, this, this is based on certain, uh, certain, certain, official, uh, certain official documents within the European Commission, uh, and this has implications for national policy, uh, and then a knockdown effect to both regional and local, local government. But while it was a multi-level issue, we saw very little multi-level coordination. That what we primarily saw was that this was an issue where local governance networks, the local level uh, stakeholders who were both public sector and NGOs were oftentimes having to step in and be ahead of the curve and have to identify responses and come up with tailor-made responses for their situations without really knowing whether they had the formal mandate to do so, the formal capacity to do so. So sometimes a sense of frustration, a sense of uncertainty uh, as to what could be done there. So that was, that was the key thing that we worked with in terms of uh, those three years, our, our three-part our three focus. Now, our output from that project was designed for both academics and practitioners. And I'll begin with the uh, practitioner output. On the left-hand side, you'll see uh, something there called the Handbook of Urban Governance of Free Movement in the EU. Uh, if anyone's interested in a copy of this, just send me an email. I can uh, get you the PDF for this. And what this does is this takes the academic portion of the study and it, uh, it in essence, rewrites it uh, into ways that are hopefully of value and hopefully of utility to those of you in the public sector, uh, dealing with issues of housing, dealing with issues of education, language education, dealing with issues of registration, dealing with issues of social integration. For those that are more interested in the academic take, uh, publications take a long time to uh, hit the market, but this is coming out on June 30th of this year. Uh, this is actually going to be a free book online. It's open access, uh, published by Springer. So, uh, so again, if you're interested in that, uh, just send me an email and I'll get you the link for when it's uh, available at the end of June. And this deals with this whole notion of mobility and migration and its governance impacts with a, with a significant focus, at least in our chapter, on municipalities in Western Europe. Now, that's the completed project. Now I'll talk a little bit about the ongoing project. Um, because what came up in this, as, as my colleagues and I sort of sat back and looked at what we had been engaged in, this broad international collaboration, what we realized is that uh, we were spending an enormous amount of time cataloging what actors were doing at the municipal level, at the national level, at the international level, but we hadn't really focused enough, we think, on the lived effects 
on the way in which these policies and practices were having an impact on the mobile EU citizens themselves, on migrants themselves. So if you fast forward, when we finished this project in uh, 2016, as we all know, by 2016, the migration landscape was very, very different. What was interesting to uh, both you and also to scholars was suddenly less a question of mobile EU citizens, but was much more a question of the effects of the Syrian refugee crisis. And so we took that concern that we had had, uh, that we saw coming out of this project, and we shifted it over to the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, and so what we, uh, we worked on throughout 2016 and 17 is a, is, a, is a smaller project that's had one output so far. It's called The Voices of Migrants. Uh, and this is, we've got a, our first piece published from this, which is in uh, the International Organization of Migration, which is the UN Migration Agency. They have a scientific journal, uh, and we, we have a piece in there coming out uh, this year in it called Talking About Integration where what we do is we shift the focus away from discussing with stakeholders such as yourselves about how they think integration programs work or introduction programs work, and we go and we sit down uh, with actual Syrian refugees to Sweden and we, and we interview them about what their experiences are. In this, uh, in this research, this is based on 60 semi-structured interviews uh, that were uh, conducted uh, during 2017, and what in essence what we're trying to do is get a sense of how they perceive the introduction program that they are jettisoned into. How do they make sense of this? I'm sure you've all seen the rather complicated charts that show what happens when somebody arrived as a refugee to Sweden, the different processes they had to go through, both in terms of residence permit and also once they got the residence permit, the different aspects of the actual introduction process. And it's enormously complex for any of us uh, to make sense of, and perhaps even more so for people who are having to live it and be in the center of it. And to long story short this, because we're already at almost 12 minutes, um, what we can say is that the, the conclusion here uh, from these individuals, and I'll come back to how I couch that as from these individuals, is that there were three perceived barriers to their meaningful integration. And that is uh, the complexity of the, the validation process. When you look at, the, uh, when you look at uh, Syrian refugees, again, a significant number arrive with rather high levels of education. Uh, minimum bachelor's degree, if not master's degree, or even higher, and a, a lengthy, frustrating process in their eyes when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, getting their educational uh, degrees validated. Uh, concerns over the quality of language programming, uh, language training. Um, it can be at times somewhat grim reading. Uh, the individuals in the interviews will talk about uh, the way in which sheets are just handed out at the beginning of the day and the teacher would leave the room for eight hours and they're left to their own devices. Uh, and then in general, lengthy administrative procedures, which they weren't alone in sort of uh, being concerned about. They express or uh, they provide comments uh, from when they spoke with uh, different individuals who actually handled their administration who said, yeah, this is a rather, rather complex process. Now I said, in, in their eyes, or, or I guess in their words. Um, because we never make the argument with this type of research that this data is the only data that should be used to characterize what goes on in the introduction programs. But what we do argue is that a lot of this type of uh, evaluation of integration program literature that we see produced by migration scholars tends to focus on the elite level. Uh, and while there is work that focuses on the voices of migrants, it's comparatively less, and there's very little that's hit the international arena uh, in the past year or two that deals specific uh, with, the, with the Syrian refugee crisis. So we think this is a bit of uh, an addition. So that's the ongoing part, and why I say that's ongoing is um, what, we, what we've been thinking about, uh, and which we're working on right now, is uh, many of you who've dealt with integration issues in previous waves of large-scale migration to Sweden uh, might recognize some of these concerns and comments and saying, well, we've been here before. Uh, I recognize these comments. Um, so what we're doing is we've, uh, we're, we're now working on a, a book 
that's going to compare uh, these types of assessments over two waves, two periods in time. That we have the Syrian refugee crisis in 2015 onward, and we're comparing it uh, through a series of uh, reflective, uh, reflective retrospective narratives of people who came from Bosnia in the 1990s. Uh, and so we're working on the Bosnian data collection uh, over the summer and into the autumn. Uh, and so we want to see really if they raise the same sorts of issues, because uh, we think that will, be, that will be interesting to compare and see what has been learned institutionally, and also simply to what degree uh, migrants maybe understandably uh, have, a, uh, have a, a, low level of, uh, a low level of patience because they want to get going, they want to get settled, they want to be involved. Now, the next upcoming piece, uh, this, is, this is our most forward-looking at the moment. Uh, this, is a, this is a research initiation project which is uh, funded by uh, Riksbank and Jubileumsfond. Um, and this is called the Framing of the Migration Crisis Cross-Nationally. Um, as I, as I think we all know, uh, a lot of the discussion in the popular media and also a lot of the discussion in the scholarly literature since 2015 has asked, well, what have the effects of the refugee crisis been? We all want to know how it has affected our society, our institutions, our agencies, uh, our relations between people, so on and so forth. And we think that's an important question. But we also think that there's another question that needs, to be, that needs to be analyzed, that we need to take a step back and understand. And that's really this question of how we got to this place where we were calling this a crisis initially. That what we see in our discussion with colleagues in, uh, in Greece, Macedonia, Germany, uh, who are going to be part of this, uh, who are going to be part of this uh, initial kickoff, is that not everyone in in each of these uh, types of states uh, uses the word crisis in the public sector at the same time. They don't all use it to mean the same thing. We see that crisis emerges within some agencies at some points in time, and then it potentially ebbs or decreases, and it appears in somewhere else, uh, in some other aspect of the administrative sector over time. And so we want to get a handle when we look back retrospectively on how in many of these, uh, in many of these states that were along this route, uh, Hungary as well, uh, how did crisis emerge? When did crisis take hold? What sort of criteria did people use to say, hey, there's a crisis going on? Uh, what role did media have in the portrayal of the crisis? And so we're gonna be meeting as a group in Turkey uh, in October of this year, and it's our, really our first chance to sit down, build links between European scholars, Middle Eastern scholars, uh, work on some ideas to get longer term financing. But since all of us have individually been doing some research on this anyway, uh, we figure it's, a, it's also a good first chance to, uh, to put together what will be a, a scholarly uh, book manuscript. So that's, that's the research side of things. Um, let's jump over now to the uh, collaboration with practitioners. Um, because if you go back to the first project that I mentioned, Imagination, uh, one of the things that, uh, that came up in the Imagination project dealing with CEE migrants, mobile EU citizens, was again, it was, it was very much a mapping project. What are the types of migrants? Uh, what allegedly would be the social implications? Uh, what are the governance types? Um, but as, as people were out doing interviews with stakeholders, those working in the public sector, um, there were questions that would, that would be posed back at us. Uh, and those questions were a lot of times, well, what do we do? What do you think we should do? These are people who are genuinely interested, they had background, they had professional competency, but they wanted an additional perspective on how to think about this issue of managing uh, integration of uh, mobile EU citizens. So I, I was very happy when in, in 2015, uh, I got the invitation from uh, the city of Amsterdam and Mira Media uh, to serve as the transnational scientific coordinator for an EU-funded project uh, that took a look at welcome policies for mobile EU citizens. Uh, this is a project that involved the city of Amsterdam, the city of Copenhagen, the city of Gothenburg, uh, the city of Brussels through the Lavetsch Stiftung, uh, Hamburg, uh, Dublin as well in Ireland. Uh, and this is, this is a very different type of project than a research project, which makes it really, really fun, 
but also for somebody who initially hadn't ever been involved in a non-research project, uh, it was like the first day of school. It was trying to, find, you know, trying to find your feet and understand what practitioners want was an enormous but very, very rewarding challenge. What made all of these cities similar was that they already had a common agenda when it came to the notion of mobile EU citizens. And, and well, you can see that that agenda comes in the term welcome. Because the, the ethos of this project, what they were organized around, was that they wanted to work towards supporting fundamental right of mobile EU citizens to freely move, work, live anywhere in any European country. They wanted to tackle the practical issues. They saw a laundry list of practical issues and we had seen these, uh, these issues as well in many of our interviews in the previous project, uh, such as the difficulty that a mobile EU citizens have in accessing relevant information when they come to, a, when they come to, their, uh, to another EU state, uh, be it about how to open a bank account, uh, be it how to start a business, be it uh, how to get into the housing queue, if there is a housing queue, uh, their private schools, public schools, what are, what are the options here? Uh, and of course, all of these are compounded by language barriers. Um, the way in which many of these cities, well, all of these cities actually, viewed it as essential to try to enhance the inclusion of these individuals in the political and civic life of the community, regardless of whether they were going to be there for six months or a year or longer, to say, well, they're, they're here and they're part, of our, they're, they're part of our space now. How do we give them a sense of involvement and inclusion? And then certainly to help with doing this work more effectively and targeting measures more specifically, they wanted to understand how to go about doing monitoring and evaluation policies to ensure that uh, they understood that they were doing uh, what was necessary in order to meet the target needs of these groups. So as said, as a research, uh, as a, as a non-research project, but as a, a project designed to, uh, to assist to assist practitioners, they had a very, very different uh, wish list of what they wanted us to focus on. So together with them, um, they wanted as a final output a, uh, a toolkit for European cities, uh, a Welcome Europe toolkit, local welcome policies for EU mobile citizens. Uh, this is also available. If you'd like this, just send me an email. And what we did here was that uh, over the course of this project, as we took a look at what was going on in each of these cities, the existing lay of the land with mobile EU citizens, one of the first things we saw, which, was, which, was, uh, which showed the utility of, for, of research, was, uh, was the fact that many of these cities, despite their interest in developing more welcoming policies, had very narrow understandings of who mobile EU citizens were. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to name specific cities at this point. I'll say one city uh, thought of a mobile EU citizen as simply the, the high, as, as sort of the, the high-flying uh, individual with, a, with sort of an education, a law degree, or, or a business person moving around from one country to another, the typical picture of the expat. Another city uh, thought of these uh, mobile EU citizens primarily as individuals who were economically vulnerable, uh, found themselves to be on the streets, uh, asking for money outside of supermarkets. And what all of them saw in the course of doing this research uh, was when they took a, a look around their cities, what they saw was that they had a much more complex picture of mobile EU citizens than they thought, which meant they needed to begin thinking about how to target policies much more narrowly at different groups. So when we talk about uh, integration, this issue was raised uh, in one of the questions most recently, uh, the integration areas were thought of as much more broadly than labor market. It was as holistic an issue, uh, holistic an approach as possible, certainly labor market core, but also housing, to make sure individuals are not vulnerable uh, when it comes to having a roof over their heads, uh, that they understood and could get access to health care where possible, uh, social inclusion being a part of the actual polity, 
uh, that welcome information could be provided to them in their, uh, hopefully, in their language, uh, that there were well-developed measures that could uh, help uh, mobile EU citizens see which NGOs might be appropriate for them for specific services, but also getting the NGOs uh, very closely linked with the public sector to prevent sometimes duplication of services. Uh, that the uh, that the public sector understood uh, a way in which policy implementation processes could work more effectively. Uh, and here there were just a lot of cities sitting down and talking to one another and asking the question, what do you do? So that type of policy and administrative learning was fantastic. Um, and then suggested measures for, uh, for keeping, for monitoring flows uh, and also for thinking about media. And, and so I said, if you'd like a copy of that toolkit, you're, uh, you're welcome to contact me. Now, at the end of this project, uh, and this project ran through, uh, through the uh, end of 2016, as one of the wrap-up events for this project, uh, we did an event at the Parliament in Brussels. Um, and, when I, and when I gave a talk there, uh, the, uh, I got several questions largely from people who were working in, uh, as, as, who were uh, bureaucrats in Brussels. And they were saying, well, this is all really good, the toolkit and this idea that we can sit down amongst ourselves now and begin planning different responses and hopefully network more, that's all really good. But what we need is training almost at the street level, bureaucrat level. We need individual training to learn how to think about these issues. Uh, what possibilities are there to organize courses where academics would come in and in non-theoretical terms, talk about specific cases, what the problems were, what the challenges, and how those either were met or could be met. And you, know, you get a question like that, and you're standing there, and you're thinking, you know, I wish we had the money to do that right now, because that's absolutely an excellent idea, and that's the type of engagement that we want to have um, between sort of the university world and those out there in the public sector. Um, and, and I can say I'm fortunate enough that, uh, that I've got that opportunity now. And that's a, a commissioned education project that's coming up this year. And this is a commissioned education project dealing with integration, dealing with migration, um, but it, its focus is not primarily on civil servants in uh, the European Union, although several European Union countries are included in it, but its focus is primarily on uh, the Eastern Partnership countries. And so I'll finish up by talking a little bit about that. Um, this is a, a Swedish Institute-funded initiative. Uh, it's called the Summer Academy for Young Professionals. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be uh, organizing a module for them called Migration and Integration in Eastern Partnership and Baltic Sea Region. Uh, we're going to be holding that in Georgia at the end of August. We'll come back to why we're going to be holding it in Georgia, where it's going to be over 40 degrees uh, at the end of August, but there's a good reason to, to stand the heat. Um, this, is, this is a program, and I, and I can actually, I, I think it's worth doing an advertisement for Swedish Institute's Summer Academy of Young Professionals program much more broadly, because this is a program that's open to individuals in Sweden as well below the age of 35. Young professional is anyone below the age of 35. Uh, and it's a, it's a number of modules focusing, in our case, migration, but other uh, providers do things on either e-governance or uh, democratic governance or sustainable public administration every year. And it's, a, it's in, intended to be an intensive two-week setting to bring together people from the Swedish public sector uh, with individuals from the Baltic states and also Eastern partnership countries uh, to further develop their skills in hopes that this, they'll be able to take these ideas with them as they move up the ladder. Um, so more narrowly, we're going to be focusing on integration and migration policy and administrative challenges for the development of inclusive societies. Uh, this is, in essence, uh, mirrors very much uh, what the uh, Swedish Foreign Ministry uh, has, as its, uh, has as its goals when dealing with, uh, when dealing with the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, this notion of uh, inclusion and building a very sustainable public administration, almost regardless of which area you look at, and migration and integration management is one of those. 
our target audience, young professionals under the age of 35. These can be policymakers, people who hold elected office. They can be uh, individuals who work in NGOs, so civil society as well. And then those of you who work in the public administration. Um, our audience, uh, in terms of uh, participants, uh, can come from Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, Sweden, and Ukraine. And to give you an idea of who's going to be attending this module and the degree to which it really reaches out to those of you who are in NGOs and also in the public administration, um, you know, we're, we, we've got the opportunity to provide training uh, with, I think, some people who already have some really impressive uh, job backgrounds. So we've got people from sort of Georgian ministries, uh, Latvian national commissions, uh, Latvian ministries here in Sweden, the International Center for Local Democracy, uh, the Red Cross, uh, UN agencies uh, for uh, refugee councils, uh, courts in Lithuania, and overall UNDP. And so it's two weeks, as said, in Tbilisi. And what we're going to be looking at um, is we're going to be trying to, in, in the least theoretical terms possible and in the most practical terms possible, be uh, talking about the challenges uh, that actors face when it comes to, to governance of migration and integration issues. Uh, the role that culture plays, the role that identity plays, the role that media plays. Uh, the importance of internally displaced peoples. And this is, this is one of the key reasons we're going to, one of the key reasons we're going to Georgia. Well, there's actually two reasons. Um, but what it comes down to with Georgia is that um, when I thought about where I wanted to put this module, uh, the other universities doing them are holding them at, at their respective university in Sweden. And, you know, and that can be very nice that people have an opportunity to come to Sweden. But what I wanted many of these people from Baltic states and from Eastern partnership countries to experience is not this sense of, okay, well, here's the Swedish solution. Sweden's done a lot right when, it's, uh, when it comes to integration, and Sweden also has made some choices which people do rethink from time to time. Um, what I wanted them to see uh, is a situation of an Eastern partnership country with rather limited financial resources that has managed to network quite well with the European Union and the international donor community uh, so that we see these public NGO cooperations and times, at times even public-private collaborations to address uh, large-scale refugee challenges. Georgia, as you know, is a country uh, that has significant number of internally displaced peoples as a result of the 2008 uh, five-day war with Russia, uh, the South Ossetia region, and also has a, has a breakaway uh, region of Abkhazia that's only recognized by a very small number of states. We'll also be uh, focusing on targeted integration measures. Again, this types of migrant issue, getting people to think in terms of different uh, constituents of migrants have different needs. Uh, and then we'll uh, put the focus down at the actual programmatic level when it comes to things such as language training, uh, civic education. And I can tell you as part of my civic education uh, lecture, uh, the city of Gothenburg, the integration center, uh, has a fantastic uh, manual about being in Sweden, which I'm sure many of you have, have seen as part of this introduction to life in Sweden. It exists in many languages. So we'll have that with us as, as, a, as at least a talking point for whether some Something like that could be a value if it doesn't already exist in all of these different settings, uh, and also skills provision. And then we'll be spending a weekend in site visits, uh, dealing uh, different locations where there are Chechen refugees, uh, and also where there will be uh, where there's also uh, these internally displaced people settlements. Now. What we hope that the individuals get out of this who work in the public sector, NGOs, policymakers, of course we hope that they get uh, the skill sets, the inspiration, the ideas, the new networks to go back to their jobs and to engage in, uh, in more enthusiastic, more focused, ever more ambitious work. But it's also a question of what do we get for the broader community of people who are in the public sector, such as, such as yourselves. What can you get out of 20 people going and sitting in uh, Georgia for two weeks thinking about integration and migration? Well, what we're doing here is as opposed to researchers writing a book for practitioners, which is a pretty standard model these days, what we're gonna be doing is having a book written by practitioners for practitioners. 
And so we're going to have a toolkit book with a preliminary title of Migration and Integration in the Eastern Partnership and Baltic Sea Region from Challenges to Good Practices. I never use the word best practices because obviously what's a good practice to you might not be a good practice to somebody in another municipality 25 kilometers up the road. These will be case studies authored by the module participants themselves where they'll highlight local challenges local context, and the possible feasible solutions. But what we're going to ask them to do is to try to stand back and to frame these for an international audience of practitioners at the conclusion. If I don't come from Moldova and this isn't my experience, why should I be interested? If I don't come from Ukraine and I don't have to worry about an outflow of people to Belarus, why should I be interested? If I don't come from Sweden or what have you, why should I be interested? Because we want something that will have the widest possible appeal that can be distributed to people uh, in municipalities uh, and states throughout the EU and the Eastern Partnership countries and that's expected in autumn of 2019. So what, you, what you've had there really is just sort of this overview of how, how you can move from research, how, you can, how research can give you inspiration not only to refine your research and go after other ideas, but how it can just bring you out of your office and bring me into a closer connection with uh, people such as yourselves uh, to learn from you, to collaborate with you, and to get the opportunity to train you. So I guess really by way of conclusion, aside from thanking you for your attention, let me say this. If you want copies of any of the publications, contact me. If you'd like to discuss possible collaboration ideas, contact me. And if you want me to come and speak to your organization, contact me. I'd be happy to do so. Thank you very much. <laughs>